coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. HIPEC is like a chemical to just kind of sterilize the microscopic stuff the surgeon can't see. And so that's why combined with surgery to remove everything that, that we can see and then chemotherapy to get rid of the stuff we can't see, those two together then increase our, our success rate or our likelihood of, of the cancer not coming back. HIPEC or hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy is used for many patients with advanced abdominal cancers. It's an alternative to traditional chemotherapy or radiation therapy. HIPEC is placed directly in contact with the tumors to kill cancer cells that may remain after surgery. And since this type of chemotherapy doesn't go throughout the body, higher doses of the drugs can be used. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dee Dee Steepen sitting in for Dr. Helena Gazelka. HIPEC stands for Hypothermic Intraperitoneal Chemotherapy. Hypothermic means warm or hot. Intraperitoneal means inside the abdominal cavity, which is encased in a sac called the peritoneum. HIPEC is used in conjunction with cancer surgery using high dose chemotherapy to kill microscopic cancer cells inside the abdominal cavity. Heating the chemotherapy drugs enhances the procedure's effectiveness. When the chemotherapy is hot, it penetrates the tissue more deeply, increasing the number of cancer cells it can reach. Here with us to discuss is Dr. Travis Groats, a surgical oncologist at Mayo Clinic. Welcome to the program. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning, Didi. Thanks for having me. Of course. So what, uh, what cancers can be treated with HIPEC and which patients would be eligible for this? Sure. So HIPEC, as you said, is, is kind of regional chemotherapy in the abdomen. So really any cancer that's just localized in the abdomen on the surface of the uh, peritoneum, like you said, um, you know, could be a candidate. There's certainly some tumors that have been well studied and we know for sure um, based on studies and, and data that works well. Um, so those two cancers are cancers of the colon, um, cancers of the appendix, um, cancers of the ovaries, cancers of the stomach, and there's even a cancer of the lining of the peritoneum called mesothelioma. So those would be the cancers I think that are well studied and well accepted. Um, you know, there's always rare tumors that um, that we have less data for, such as cancer of the of the um, pancreas or gallbladder or um, small intestine, that we don't know yet if if that's the right treatment. Sounds good. And can you can you explain sort of in lay terms how exactly mm -hmm. this works? Sure. So uh, the way the way I kind of uh, explain it to, to people is that um, it's like if you have a, a dirty uh, you know countertop or table, um, you you want to clean off all the dirt and, and grime and stuff. And so surgery, the surgical part of the HIPEC is to remove any tumor the surgeon can see. But you know if you want to eat on that countertop, you want it clean and sterile and get rid of the bacteria. So um, we use chemicals like bleach or, or um, anti uh, um, bacterial disinfectants to clean the countertop. So. HIPEC is like a chemical to just kind of sterilize the microscopic stuff the surgeon can't see. And so that's why combined with surgery to remove everything that, that we can see um, and then chemotherapy to get rid of the stuff we can't see, those two together then um, increase our, our success rate or our likelihood of, of the cancer not coming back. That's a great explanation. I, I like that comparison. <laughs> uh, so who can perform HIPEC? So, you know, HIPEC is a, a pretty complex um, procedure. Um, and so it, it, it takes a, there's a long learning curve from the surgeon standpoint, the hospital standpoint, the anesthesia, the whole team standpoint. Um, so it takes specialized training. So um, most places that or most people, surgeons who do it are uh, what's called surgical oncologists, which are cancer surgeons who have, um, they're general surgeons who have done another two years of uh, additional focused training in cancer uh, surgery. And part of that uh, two-year time is dedicated to, to HIPEC. So um, cancer surgeons and then also gynecological oncologists are also, uh, for ovarian cancer, also are specialized in, in HIPEC. Very good. And what can patients expect to experience during a HIPEC procedure? Sure. I think this is probably one of the hardest questions to answer because it's very variable depending upon um, the surgery component of it. So um, some patients may have lots of tumor, may need a more extensive surgery um, component of it. And so obviously the more extensive the surgery will be, the longer the recovery and comp you know higher risk of complications and things like that. And some people have very little um, uh, tumor in their abdomen. And so the surgery can actually be very um, minimal. And so those patients may recover uh, much quicker. And then sometimes we even do the HIPEC alone without surgery. Um, and so that you know obviously would have a different recovery. 
But in general, I would say the chemotherapy, what it adds to, or HIPEC, what it adds to the surgery is probably, you know, some fatigue. I think I always warn patients it's going to take um, several months for them to get their stamina level up. It just kind of wears people out. Um, I think there's also a component, um, you know, your bowels are bathed in chemotherapy. So there's some irritable bowel kind of symptoms that people can experience, like gassy abdominal cramping, you know, intermittent nausea or diarrhea. It's generally mild and, and again, resolves uh, over a few months, but um, it's something that, that people can experience. Um, and then in general, there's, there's less side effects than, than giving it through the vein. And that's, that's the whole reason why we do the HIPEC is because less of it's being uh, absorbed. So there's less side effects um, in, in general. What are the risks of uh, this procedure? Sure. So, so, you know, the risks of, of HIPEC, again, just the HIPEC portion, you know, the chemo again is, is usually not uh, as much of it as absorbed, but some can be. And so some, some chemotherapy drugs we use, depending on the type of cancer, can be hard on the kidneys. Um, and so there's certain things that we do to decrease that risk. And, and usually uh, using those, those um, parameters or those extra steps uh, minimizes that risk. Um, again, the fatigue we talked about, um, the irritable bowels we talked about, it can drop your counts. Again, usually like your weight cell counts and things like that. Usually that's mild and, and not, um, you know, really a, a problem, but another thing to watch out for um, after surgery or after HIPEC. And what are we talking, what, what kind of success rate does this um, HIPEC procedure have? Sure. So that's, you know, that's very variable again. Um, and it, it depends on, on two things really, I think are the two most important one is is the ability of the surgeon to get all the tumor out, um, and so if and so that's you know when surgeons are evaluating patients if they're candidates, they have to be confident they can remove all the tumor, um, and so um, that's a critical step is is being able to remove all the tumor, and 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 in, in terms of success success. And then second part is the type of tumor. So some tumors are slower growing. Um, and are maybe more sensitive to chemotherapy and um, are also less um, invasive, meaning less sticky, so we can peel them off pretty easy. Um, and so those tumors, like, like um, the classic uh, pseudomyxoma um, peritonei, which is uh, jelly belly is another name for that, where it's a tumor of the appendix. It's very um, mucinous, a lot of jelly. Um, those, those tumors, you know, the survival, long-term survival can be quite high, 60, 70%. Um, so that success rate is very high. In, in some tumors, very aggressive tumors like stomach cancer, colon cancer, you know, the success rate might be, you know, lower, long-term success rate, um, you know, more in the kind of 25 to 35, 40% range. Um, so that's kind of long-term success. Short-term success, I think of as two, is an, is an important part too. I think, um, you know, chemotherapy is no fun. Um, and so the surgery, oftentimes, even if we're not successful in the long-term, can um, extend people's survival in the short-term. And, and provide time off of therapy um, where people don't have any cancer, um, they're not getting any treatment. Um, and that time frame is, is you know, um, variable again, but at least it usually on average provides some time, a year and a half or two years of, of um, time without any cancer uh, recurrence and, and off of uh, therapy. So that can be a, a short-term benefit as well. Very good. Uh, you talked a little bit about what recovery is like for patients, kind of depends a little bit. Is there anything else um, that people should know about recovery? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it, it's, it might be helpful to talk to other, other patients who, who've gone through it. And there's a lot of, you know, online, um, you know, websites and other patients. And there's, you know, podcasts like this and other webinars that um, kind of explain it. But again, everybody's individual. So it's hard to, um, you know, take too much from, from each uh, person's experience. Um, but I think, again, people just need to know that it, it is a big surgery and that there's, you know, they'll need some help at home and some recovery. And I think one of the hard things people struggle with is, is that general, you know, several month period of, again, the fatigue and, you know, not feeling the greatest. And I think it kind of leads to some depression. I mean, I think it's hard to feel kind of blah for, for a couple of months. And so I think getting that support from your family and friends and, um, and recognizing that and trying to find, you know, joy in life and, and things around you and what you can do is helpful. Um, and so I think that's something we, we try to help 
um, patients with in recovery point too. Absolutely. That's so important. Um, what are some questions patients should ask their healthcare professionals about HIPEC when they're, you know, when they're at these appointments? Yeah, I mean, hopefully they're they're getting a good explanation like this about um, you know what to expect about the the surgery. You know, there's the surgery side of the high pec. Um, there are um, you know surgeons can can do laparoscopy, which is uh, minimally invasive surgery where they stick a camera in and take a look around to see where the cancer is. We can get scans like CT scans, MRIs, um, so we can get a good idea of how extensive surgery would be. But there's always a little bit of unknown, which I think is sometimes hard for patients because um, at the end of the day, our goal is to get all the tumor out. And so there might be, um, when we get in there, um, we might see tumor we didn't see before on the laparoscopy or the CT scan. And so surgery can sometimes change um, in the operating room. Um, again, the goal is to get all the cancer out and you know, obviously have good outcome in terms of quality of life and recovery. And so that's a, a fine balance that's always, um, you know, what the surgeon's trying to strive to get. Um, so I think, you know, they need to learn from the surgeon what they anticipate the surgery would look like and, and how extensive it would be. Um, but they have to recognize there's going to be some flexibility. I think, again, it's a very complex surgery. So I think, you know, it is one of those ones where there's a direct volume to outcome relationship in terms of how patients do. And, you know, most surgeries, you know, you do 20 or 30 of them and you kind of gotten over the learning curve and, and, and surgeons are competent and, and comfortable with it. But this surgery, actually the research suggests it's closer to 120, 150 um, procedures before, you know, the outcomes are really um, ideal. And so I think it's important, um, not just from the surgeon standpoint, but the whole institution and, and having the whole progress or process of, um, you know, medical oncologists and their enrollment and involvement in chemotherapy and having the nutritionists and the nurses and the anesthesiologists and the whole, um, the whole multidisciplinary team, I think is really important. So um, those are things to ask about, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, is HIPAA available at all cancer centers? Um, and is it covered by insurance? Good questions. Um, so like I said, again, it, it is somewhat regionalized, just given um, the complexity of it. So not available probably at every cancer center, but it is involved, uh, sorry, available at m most or a lot of cancer centers. Um, there are, you know, several that are, you know, very high volume, and there's many that, that do a, a fair amount. Um, as far as insurance coverage, that's always a tough one because it's every insurance is different. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think the, the ones I just uh, mentioned before, colon, uh, appendix, um, stomach, and ovarian cancer, there's, there's very good data, um, you know, high-level data research trials that suggest that there's a, a significant benefit um, to the HIPEC uh, portion of, this, of the procedure. And so um, those in general are covered by insurance companies. Um, the other ones where we have less data for it, those are a little bit tougher um, just because they're either less, look less common or um, less well studied. And so those are a little harder sometimes to get insurance to cover. Good to know. Well, our thanks to Dr. Travis Groats, a surgical oncologist at Mayo Clinic for being with us today. Thanks for the great conversation. Thanks, Didi. Appreciate it. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts.